Hello everyone, this is Sirius Trivia, and welcome back to the first Emperor of Wei Let's Talk lore series as we look to conclude this series with its final episode titled The Usurption of the Han. Now in our previous episode, we have already briefly talked about the death of Cao Cao and the ascension of Cao Pi as the Duke of Wei, before ultimately usurping the Han officially in October of 220. But the actual process of usurping the Han is not so simple. For the majority of our series, we have largely focused on Cao Pi's struggle to become heir, which is more or less an internal family struggle. But after 217, when Cao Cao officially named Cao Pi as heir, following Cao Zhi's self-sabotage, both Cao Cao and Cao Pi knew that the real goal ahead was the usurpation of the Han Dynasty, which will be no easy task despite Emperor Liu Xie's lack of power as the Han was a behemoth institution that had stood the test of time for 400 years, and change will not come without resistance from those still loyal to the Han at court. And these loyalists will make their last-ditch effort to stop Cao Cao and Cao Pi in 219. At the time, Cao Cao had just suffered a massive loss in his retreat out of Hanzhong after being beaten by Liu Bei, and not long after, Guan Yu shocked the world when he flooded Yu Jin's reinforcement army to the Jin province and forced their surrender. And for a moment, those loyalists decided to pounce as they believed this was their time to stop Cao Cao. And at this time, Cao Cao was not in the capital city of Ye, as the high casualties due to the retreat from Hanzhong forced his army and thus himself to spend a few extra months in Chang'an in order to muster back their strength. Then when news of Guan Yu's advancement on the Jin province broke out, Cao Cao decided to march his forces to Luoyang instead of returning to Ye, as Luoyang was closer to Xuchang, where the emperor was being kept. So with Cao Cao's army away, and Yu Jin taking most of the northern reserve forces away, the city of Ye was lightly guarded and a group of Han loyalists led by Wei Feng attempted a coup to take the city. With hopes to capture Cao Pi, who was left in charge at this time, and to seize control of the imperial court. Now Wei Feng, by and large, was a nobody who did not come from any notable clans and did not even hold a high position, as he was just an assistant in the prime minister's office at this time, with not a single troop under his command. But Wei Feng was a renowned speaker who had befriended many of the younger generations of officials, and in his circle were the two sons of Wang Tan, who was a member of the seven sons of Jian An, Liu Wei, the younger brother of Liu Yi, who was a court astronomer and a distant relative to the imperial clan, Zhang Quan, the son of Zhang Xiu, and the sons of Song Zhong, who had come from a powerful gentry clan in the Jin province, were all his friends. Now, at first glance, this group of youngsters seem like nobodies as well, but there is a bigger connection here that connects all of them, as they're all related to Liu Biao and thus Liu Bei. Now, many people might have forgotten that Liu Bei had stayed in the Jin province for seven long years under Liu Biao. And not only did he win the hearts of the local civilians during this time, he also won over much of Liu Bao's court, as many of the gentry clans within the Jin province supported him. Now, while not all of them were able to join him following Liu Bao's death, as many ended up joining Cao Cao alongside their new lord, Liu Tong, they were still deep down supportive of Liu Bei and his efforts to restore the Han. And this would be true for people like Wang Tan, Liu Yi, Zhang Xiu, and Song Zhong, as they were all working for Liu Bao in the past. Now, while many of them have died already by this period, their sons now carry their wishes to restore the Han. But unfortunately for this rebellion, at the last moment, the lieutenant of the guards who was working with them, named Chen Yi, got scared as he ratted them out to Cao Pi, and what followed was a massive purge of Han loyalists by Cao Pi as dozens of related 
and unrelated officials who were suspecting of supporting the Han were executed along with their family and clan, which ultimately helped clear the path for Tulpi's eventual usurpation down the line. Then following this purge, the next big test for Tulpi came following Cao Cao's death, as Cao Cao would never get a chance to return to the capital of Ye, as he would pass away in Luoyang in January of 220. Now even though Cao Pi was ready to name heir, the transition of power is always a dangerous period, as Cao Pi had to quickly reshuffle the court to put his supporters in charge. Jia Xu was named as the Grand Commandant, Hua Xin was named as the Chancellor, Wang Lang was named as Grand Excellency, and in terms of military reassignment, Xia Houdun was named Grand General, while envoys were also sent out quickly to all the nomadic chieftains in the north to present them with new titles and to inform them that Cao Pi is now their new liege. And aside from officials, Cao Pi also had many brothers to deal with. Cao Zhi, the longtime rival for heir, would be marginalized immediately as his supporters in the Ding brothers would end up being executed along with their branches of the Ding clan. While this might seem extra cruel and a bit unnecessary, Ding Yi was directly responsible for the death of Cui Yan, who was not only a supporter of Cao Pi, but also Cao Pi's tutor since Cao Pi was a child. So killing Ding Yi to avenge his teacher definitely made some sense. Now Yang Xiu had already been killed by Cao Cao the year prior, as Cao Cao had always been very active in clearing the path for his children, and since Cao Pi was picked as heir in 217, Yang Xiu, who had supported Cao Zhi behind Cao Cao's back, became an instant liability for Cao Pi's future reign. So using a military incident during the retreat from Hanzhong as an excuse, Yang Xiu was executed. And for a moment, Cao Cao actually wanted to execute Sima Yi as well, because he feared that Cao Pi would be unable to tame Sima Yi's talent and ambitions, much like how Cao Cao had Zhou Bu Yi assassinated following Cao Chong's death. But due to Cao Pi's friendship with Sima Yi, Cao Cao hesitated and allowed Sima Yi to live. Now to be fair, Sima Yi would go on to serve Cao Pi faithfully, and it wasn't until the regency conflicts with Cao Shuang during Cao Rei's reign that Sima Yi would even start planning for the usurpation. But clearly that's a story for another time, as now with his own officials in position and the Han loyalists mostly exterminated, Cao Pi's path to usurpation was finally cleared, as by October of 220, the last Han emperor, Liu Xie, would officially offer abdication to Cao Pi on October 13th. Cao Pi would refuse this initial offer, as customary in Chinese culture, where feigned refusal were seen as a sign of politeness and humility. Of course, the emperor knew full well that Cao Pi's refusal was only a matter of formality, as he would continue to offer the abdication in the following weeks, before finally after three refusals, Cao Pi would finally accept the fourth offer on October 29th to 20 as the Han dynasty officially comes to an end. Liu Xie would pass on the Mandate of Heaven to Cao Pi and the Wei dynasty, as he would now be named as Duke of Shenyang, where he would live out the rest of his days in peace, as Liu Xie had been a puppet emperor his entire life from the moment Dong Zhuo put him on the throne. Now of course, Liu Xie would still be under house arrest essentially for the rest of his life, but he was definitely more carefree, living as the Duke of Shenyang than when he was the puppet emperor of the Han, when death was a real possibility, as peaceful abdication was never a guarantee. And before we end our series here, there are two notable siblings of Cao Pi that we still have to mention. First was Cao Pi's younger sister, Cao Jie, who was the wife of Liu Xie, and the last empress of the Han. And when Cao Pi finally accepted the abdication, he had sent eunuchs to the imperial palace to fetch the imperial seal. But Cao Jie, who favored her husband, refused to give up the seal. 
But as more and more Unix turned up asking for it, Cao Jie knew she couldn't keep the seal forever. So she ended up throwing the seal at the Unix as she cursed her brother that the heaven will never favor him. Now Cao Pi would obviously not hurt his little sister as Cao Jie would end up following Liu Xie to Shenyang where she will become the Duchess of Shenyang as this couple would live out the rest of their days together in this princedom where they would spend most of their time rebuilding the land and helping local civilians. Cao Jie would even become a doctor as their palace was transformed into a free clinic for whoever needed help. And Cao Jie would go on to live a long life until she would pass away of old age in 260 as her husband Liu Xie would die in 234. And their kids continue to inherit the title of Duke of Shenyang for three more generations until Liu Qiu would end up being killed during the invading nomadic invasions that occurred following the weakening of the Jin dynasty post the Eight Princes Rebellion. Now aside from Cao Jie, the last sibling we need to cover is another one of Lady Ban's son in Cao Zhang, who is the middle brother in between Cao Pi and Cao Zhi. And while Cao Cao had always been quite ashamed of this unstudious son during his youth, Cao Zhang ended up becoming quite the general after growing up as he ended up volunteering to be stationed on the frontiers where he became quite famous defending against nomadic incursions. While he was never considered a possible candidate for heir, there are plenty of modern day conspiracy theories surrounding a potential coup attempt after Cao Cao's death. In a popular fictional story written during the southern dynasties that followed the Jin dynasty, Cao Zhang was portrayed as someone who ended up marching a 100,000 strong army to the gates of Luoyang following Cao Cao's death in an attempt to seize control and become heir. But Jia Xu was able to convince him to leave peacefully. And then out of fear for his brother to rebel in the future, Cao Pi ordered Cao Zhang away to Shuofang for three years to fight the Nomads, and then after Cao Zhang returned to the new capital city of Luoyang, Cao Pi poisoned and killed Cao Zhang using dates as the two of them played a game of Go together. Now I can confirm this story here is entirely false, but the author of this story did cleverly use many historical facts to make this story sound plausible. First, at the time of Cao Cao's death, Cao Zhang was summoned by Cao Cao to Luoyang because Cao Cao had previously summoned him to Chang'an for the Hanzhong campaign. But the campaign had already ended in failure before Cao Zhang's forces arrived at the front lines. So while assessing Guan Yu's attack on the Jin province, Cao Cao ended up summoning Cao Zhang to Luoyang to reinforce the army there. But Cao Cao would end up dying before Cao Zhang's army would actually arrive. And by that time, Guan Yu was already dead, and Cao Pi had now taken control of the courts. So he did turn his brother around and send him back to the frontiers to continue fighting the Nomads. But this is not out of fear for Cao Zhang, as Cao Pi would end up giving Cao Zhang the title of Prince of Rencheng right after becoming emperor himself, and the assignment of Cao Zhang to the frontier was simply putting him where he wanted to be, and where his talents would be best used, as that's where he had been most of his life. Now the unfortunate coincidence occurred in 223, as after Cao Zhang returned from his campaign to report back to the imperial court back in Luoyang, he would suddenly die of illness at the age of 35, which is super suspicious, but the poison date story can't be true, as Cao Zhang was recorded to have died on June 17th, and the date fruits don't harvest until August to October. Now of course Cao Pi could have poisoned him with something else, but by 223, Cao Pi was firmly entrenched as emperor, and Cao Zhang was definitely not a threat to Cao Pi or his son Cao Rei, so there really was no reason to kill him as even Cao Zhi was spared despite being a direct competition for heir. And speaking of Cao Zhi, while he would be spared, he would be shunned politically by Cao Pi, and even his financial situation deteriorated vastly, 
As if we remember, back in 217, Cao Zhi already had 10,000 households providing tax money for his title under Cao Cao. But once Cao Pi took over as the Duke of Wei, Cao Zhi would drop to just 800 households from 10,000, as Cao Pi would end up reassigning his titles. Then after Cao Pi became emperor, Cao Zhi did get one of the eleven princedoms set up by Cao Pi. But his princedom of Zhencheng only was given a household tax income of 2,500 households, while all the other brothers, such as Cao Zhang, had 10,000. Cao Pi would eventually raise this number to 3,000, so a 500 increase, after visiting Cao Zhi in 223. But Cao Zhi would never go any higher under Cao Pi and Cao Rui, as both were very careful. To never use him. Now, as for the story about writing a poem in seven steps to save his life, where Cao Zhi had to compare his relationship to Cao Pi to boiling beans that were from the same stock, there is actually no historical evidence that Cao Zhi wrote that poem, as the story itself only exists in *Romance of the Three Kingdoms*, and the poem itself is probably a work from later periods by an unknown poet. That is wrongly attributed to Cao Zhi, whose actual works were well documented and well preserved. So, with that, Cao Pi is officially the first emperor of Wei, and our lore series also comes to an end. Now, we will return in the future for a series covering Cao Pi's seven-year reign as the emperor. But for the time being, we're going to shift our attention to the two other kingdoms, as Liu Bei. Will very soon take up the banner as the Emperor of Han, following Cao Pi's usurpation, and more importantly, the Battle of Yiling between Liu Bei and Sun Quan is about to unfold. So when we return next time, we'll continue the story following Guan Yu's death from Liu Bei's point of view, as we'll kick off our Battle of Yiling Let's Talk Lore series next week. So until then, bye.